Uh, there will be hopefully some time at the end for questions, but I will be around for the rest of the afternoon and this evening, so uh, do feel free to grab me, or as I mentioned, ping me on social media. So I thought we'd just start off at the beginning with um, what we mean by open source, the kind of big picture. How many of you guys use open source in your development? How many of you use open source in your general everyday life? At some point, most of us will come across open source in some way, shape or form. Um, so it's probably most well known in the context of development. Open source is very much something that is considered to be um, to do with code and geeky stuff and what have you. Um, and it's extensively used in development. So I first came across the principles of open source through the Joomla project. Um, but then I started to explore all these other things that were open source and realised it wasn't just about Joomla, actually there were loads of other open source things out there, which was really quite exciting at that time. And I first came across it when I was at university, actually, and <coughs> I studied sports science and physiotherapy, so completely unrelated to tech. Um, but I also have been a geek at heart since I was like this big, playing with my mum's Amstrad, black and white 9512, making little Pac-Man games run across the screen and things. Um, and I needed some beer money really and I knew how to fix computers and I worked on the help desk but we were sending people off to PC World and other such places and they were charging them hundreds of pounds to put proprietary uh, antivirus software, not to name any names on there, which inevitably the students would then not bother renewing because they couldn't afford it the next year and they'd be back again a year later with viruses because they weren't up to date. And so at the time I lived with three guys who were all geeks and they were all computer science students and they were, they were telling me about these open source solutions that I could use instead of all of these other proprietary ones. Um, so I started kind of offering that up to people and saying, look, there is an alternative. You could use this. It's free. It's open source um, and so forth. At that point, I wasn't really contributing back. I was very much taking. Um, beer money was more important to me at that point. And then when I graduated, I started to look at doing web design um, and taking the principles that I learned from, from the antivirus and so forth, I looked for open source solutions that I could get in and change and that wasn't going to cost me and there wasn't a massive overhead in terms of finance to actually learn how to use it. And that's kind of taken me forward. Um, uh, also, I came to understand about the different licenses that are around and uh, it's a real topical question at the moment in the Joomla community because some of you may know that Joomla is licensed under the GPL license, which is great for users but not so great for developers. You can't take it and put it into a proprietary system, for example. But now that um, we've separated out the framework, the guys who've actually done all the development on that are saying that we want to license this under a different license so that proprietary people can actually use our building blocks to uh, put that into their own software. And that's created this huge storm about we don't want to change from GPL, we don't think people should be doing proprietary because they don't contribute back and so forth. So there's, there's lots of different ways in which open source can be used right at the end of being very, very open to being quite restrictive but still being open source. So this whole discussion got me looking into more about well, what does it actually mean to be open source. I thought I understood it and then when I started reading up on licenses I was like, wow, I really don't understand it at all. So I'm getting there with my understanding of open source. Um, but it's all, it kind of all came about through a concept called the four freedoms. I don't know if any of you have um, come across the four freedoms or know anything about them. Um, it was developed by a guy called Richard Stallman uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And at that point in time, um, a lot of software was being produced uh, closed source, proprietary and so forth. And he really didn't think that that was right. He felt that um, you should be able to get in and see how software works. You should be able to share it with people. You should be able to um, make changes and then redistribute it. But under the closed source lines, um, proprietary licenses, that wasn't actually possible. So he put together this concept of the freedoms, uh, which explained open source, explained what he was trying to um, encourage people to adopt. And we're talking about um, free as in free speech, not free as in free beer here. Okay, so we're talking about freedom to use things rather than zero cost. Um, and I, the reason I chose this image of the doors is because I really believe that these freedoms do mean like an open door. It gives you opportunities. It gives you the chance to do things with the, with the code. Um, and not all open source projects apply 
each of the freedoms in the same way. So I'll mention a few of those as we go along. So the first freedom is actually freedom zero, and it's not a geek thing, although it is quite a geek thing. Uh, apparently he came up with, one to, with, with the other ones and then realised that this one needed to actually come before them. So it came in at freedom zero. So <coughs> anyway. And freedom zero is the freedom to run the programme for any purpose, whatever purpose you want. So it might be that you run it for the original intended use, or it might be that you find a program or you find some code that was intended to be used in this way, but you want to use it in that way. And that's fine, that's what this freedom is all about. And there's the freedom from the perspective of the end user. So I download Joomla and I can install it and do whatever I feel like with it. And there's also the freedom from the perspective of the developer, so that you can take some code and put it into another project. So there's kind of two ways of looking at it. And some licenses, like GPL, for example, give a lot of freedom to the end user, but not so much freedom to the developers. And some of the other licenses, like BSD and MIT and so forth, give more freedom to the developers to do more stuff, and less freedom to the users. So it, it isn't about open source means everything's free, uh, or nothing is free, and so forth. There, there is kind of like movement, depending on which <coughs> licenses you, you choose. And the next freedom is freedom one which allows you to be able to get in and see how the program works, change it if you want to, um, and have it do what you want it to do. So it might be that you uh, install something or you uh, start using a library and there's a bug. Someone's left a semicolon or they've made a typo or um, something along those lines. And with this freedom, you can actually go in and change that, fix it, make it better. Um, but it might be also that you find a particular part of the code that doesn't work properly or that is kind of so last century um, and you want to make that work more efficiently. And um, we find this particularly in queries uh, that are not written very efficiently and then when we scale it up to very, very big sites it just falls over. And we want to be able to go in and change that so that it works better for us. And the opposite of that can be found with closed source. If there's a bug, you have to wait for the developers to actually fix it before you can actually do anything about it. So the beauty of open source in this respect is that you can potentially go in and fix stuff quite quickly. And I love just being able to poke about and stuff and see how it works. You know, it saves time. If you see something on a particular project, you can go in and see how that works and potentially take that and use it in your own, depending on the license. And the next freedom is the freedom to redistribute this so that you can help your neighbour. So like when I was at university, if I found a piece of software that worked really well, I could then potentially give that to someone else and say, here, use this. Um, and this was particularly useful if people are just clueless. You can just say, just install this and do this and it will work. And they don't have to worry about licences. There's not always money being exchanged. And an analogy of this one is um, often uses like a recipe so like in my family, we've got a Christmas cake recipe that's kind of been passed down to generations. So like my mum's mum and my dad's mum had it and then they passed it down and then they passed it down and so forth. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of idea that you can give this out to other people. And the next one kind of builds on that in that you can actually make changes and then you can pass your changes on. And depending on what license you're using, um, depends on how you can do that. So some licenses say if you make changes, you have to release it using the same license that you had before, and other licenses say you can, use, you can do whatever, basically. The GPL, if you make changes, it has to be released as GPL. You can't release it with a different license. Um, so in my recipe analogy here, I'm vegan, or trying to be vegan, and so Christmas cake recipe comes to me, it's got eggs in it, it's got this, that, and the other in it. So I might say, right, okay, well, how can I make this vegan? take those things out, replace it with these things, and then I share it with my vegan friends. Say, hey, this is the Cheesley family recipe. It's like tried and tested, and now I've made it vegan. See what you think. And they might say, well, that's rubbish. What are you using that for? This is a much better substitute for eggs than that. So they contribute back to it. I give it a try. Oh, yeah, actually, that is better. Or actually, no, that was awful, and it never actually worked. So that's, a, that's how that kind of analogy works. And so... This is how a lot of open source projects move forward, I guess, is that people do make changes and they do give that back to the community with the view of improving it for all. Okay, and so I mentioned that we're talking about free speech rather than free beer, unfortunately. 
Um, and what we mean by this is that um, the freedom to be able to um, go in and make changes, to be able to see what's happening in the code, to be able to help other people. Um, sometimes people do get a bit confused and they think free, free, um, like free and open source software means free no money, like I don't have to pay for it. Um, and people often ask me, how do you actually make money as a business only using open source software and open source technology? We provide service. If people want to learn the skills that we've got to be able to do their websites, to be able to look after their service, then fine. But a lot of them don't have the time, the energy or the inclination. So the software that we're working with is free. And yes, they could just pick it up and do it themselves, and a lot of them do. A lot of them then end up coming back to us when they realise that they can't. Um, so, yeah, it is often confused that people think that because it's open source, it's free. And as I've mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, there are all kinds of licenses that you can use. And licenses can be used together. So I mentioned the, the storm we've got going on in the Joomla community at the moment, which is that the framework developers, in my opinion, rightly so, want to license the framework as a lesser GPL license, which means that basically it's the same as the GPL, but it means that people who are working with proprietary licenses can take that information and use it in their packages, in their projects or what have you. But when it comes back into Joomla, which is underpinned by the framework, it's licensed under GPL. So we've got the best of both worlds if we use that kind of arrangement. Um, so there's all kinds of um, licenses. If any of you use Flickr, you're probably familiar with Creative Commons, and a lot of musicians are looking at the Creative Commons way uh, of licensing open source. And then the nice thing about Creative Commons is that they have the legalese jargon, but they also produce a, a read-friendly version, a normal user version, basically. So it says, you can do this, you can do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And so it makes the licensing much more easy for people to understand. So they're much more likely to consider open sourcing something if they actually understand what, what it means, what people can and can't do with your stuff. And there's a whole other range. Has anyone come up with anything, come across any licenses that were really, really restrictive? Anyone come up with it or any kind of problems with licensing or anything like that? Yeah, um, I can only talk a little bit about it, but we had a client who are involved in the rights industry in general, mm -hmm. and they needed a software product built as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And their stance on the rights community is not anti-open source or mm -hmm. anti-open rights, but they certainly have that kind of slant. And the quickest way to build their software, which they needed, was using open source technology. Mm. Went, oh yeah, sure, that's not a problem. It's open source and it was under an MIT license, so we were mm. good to go. Mm. And they, the way they were an advocate, they were advocating private rights holders, and they mm. wouldn't let us use the open source technology because of their mm. own internal issues with it. And yeah. they were like, but this is the quickest, cheapest, best. Wait, the software was great. Yeah. So like, this is a, this is they've solved your problem. Everyone in the community here has done your work for you. And they're like, yeah, well, we can't actually use that because. Yeah. Bad things. And they, yeah. they can say why, just because it's positive. Yeah. I mean, and that is something, that, and also a lot of the, it comes down to people not understanding the licenses that are available. Um, so there's a heck of a lot of, um, how, many, how many people, we've had some new people come in, so how many people use um, open source in development at the moment? So those of you who don't use open source in development, what are your main issues for not using it? Is it because your company doesn't allow you to, or...? Anyone able to say? It's said it's restriction when I work. Mm -hmm. That you're not able to use open source? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because of a stack that's more um, closer bound together to use Microsoft tech, the whole yeah. way through the stack. Right. We have quite a lot of technologies and yeah. trying to find interfaces between the various open source technologies yeah. a lot harder. Yeah. Um, even though it costs us a lot more money, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure, sure. And it's sort of having a, a known, what's the right word, uh, sort of a known standard as well. I think mm. in some ways it's it's sort of like it's more safe in some ways, I guess, because yeah. you can always go back and say, yeah. you know, this doesn't work. Yeah. Sure. Why? What you know? Can you find it? And they, they they should hopefully be able to have an answer. Obviously, mm. we don't do that very often, but yeah. but 
you'd hope that they all come along and fix one so sure. we don't have the ability to go in and go well this is rubbish it's it's we a balance isn't it, it between having someone who's responsible that you can go and say well i pay for this so fix it and then having the ability to go in and actually fix it yourself or you know ping someone in the community and say look this you fix that this bug was patched but it's not actually patched properly or it doesn't work there are certain there are workarounds we have to put in place because yeah. there was not certain features at the time we wrote the software. Yeah. Which then features. you never go back and yeah, <laughs> you never go back and then fix them even yeah. though the new software is out because you've yeah. moved on and it's it's, yeah. it's 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 all problematic sometimes. Yeah. But that's yeah. the way we've chosen to go. Sure, and I think I mean I'm certainly finding that there is there is a lot more interest in open source nowadays. There are a lot more people considering open source and sometimes considering it just in small bits, small chunks to see how it works. So maybe including certain libraries um, because otherwise they'd have to write it all themselves and that just would defeat the object. And as an entrepreneur, that's just not, that's just daft if it's there already. But there are these battles to overcome. Uh, you know, it is challenging. If you're working in a proprietary environment, how can you, can you consider even bringing an open source? So on the other end of the spectrum, there are mm -hmm. companies like I guess Netflix and mm. other companies like that that actively hate working with vendors and will always try and always go for open source. source. Open source, yeah. Yeah. And Netflix do use Silverlight because of DRM. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a product. Yeah. yeah, and so I guess from from my perspective, it's really interesting hearing about these big, really big companies who do go for that. Like we're only going to go with open source. Um, because they are trying to find creative ways around these issues that people here are mentioning. And it's interesting to me hearing it from the developer's side, because I tend to hear it from the business side, which is give us open source. You know, we want the ability to be able to have a really wide community, we don't want to be tied into a vendor, we don't want to be paying loads of money, and so forth. But it, it works both ways, so it's what's great for one group of people is not so great for another. Um, so I guess I'm not saying that open source is the only way forward, but what I'm going to talk about a little bit um, in the next slides is some ways that the principles of open source that have come from coding have been used in the wider world. Um, and uh, we were having a chat in our office about like where would technology be without open source. Um, and this was what one of my guys picked up. <laughs> you know, he's like, well, it would be back in the Stone Age. And I was just thinking, you know, if if every single piece of software out there had to be proprietary written, had to be um, you know, it was licensed for a fee and you couldn't see what had been done by the developers because the code was encrypted. There would be so many things, especially in web development, that wouldn't be there right now. And what you were talking about your Echolab project, so I'm fairly sure a lot of the things you use there is probably from open source. And if you had to write it all yourself, it just, you wouldn't, smaller businesses should, certainly would, just wouldn't be able to do that, and individual freelancers perhaps. Do you think we'd end up more like the, if you take the pharmaceutical industry, like for example, with these huge companies with big R&D budgets who pump, mm -hmm. there, there would be some poor people making everything because we would, would still need the software. And could you imagine if it took 20 years for responsive web design to come around? Do you know what I mean? Concepts like that, you just think, would it actually happen quickly enough to keep up with the change of technology? Would technology have changed quite so quickly if these um, open source innovations and things didn't come around so quickly? Um, so this is a quote which actually is often attributed to Linus Torvald, but he said it, at best it's probably a flippant comment he made and at worst he doesn't remember saying it. So anyway, but I do really like that. Um, it generated quite a bit of discussion in uh, some of my, uh, some in the leadership team actually of Joomla, like could you actually open source everything? Would it create like a, a worldwide sharing, caring community or would it just create chaos? <laughs> and we had quite an interesting discussion, and some were on one side and some were on the other side. Um, but what I'd like to explore is a couple of the um, industries where you wouldn't normally think about open source, but where open source has been, has been um, attempted and, and what actually happened. And interesting what you were saying, Max, um, the first one is the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so pharmaceutical industry historically spends absolute ridiculous amounts of money on research and development. And they are so close source, it's ridiculous. In, in terms of their product development process. It is absolutely top secret what they're working on, how they make the molecules, what they're testing it, how they're doing it, how the scans are happening and so forth. Um, so to bring open source into this kind of equation seems really mad, like how would they do that when they've got hundreds of thousands, millions even of pounds worth invested in this research? Because if you open source that, then it's not your secret anymore and you can't get that patent because other people 
have got that intellectual property. So how are you going to make your money back? Um, and I don't, do you guys watch TEDx videos or TED videos, TED talks? They're absolutely, well, I love them, I think they're fantastic. And there's a doc, uh, Dr. Jay Bragner did a talk back in 2011, 12, I think it was. And he, um, he was working on a compound which was, um, they were trying to figure out a way of uh, breaking a cycle of um, cancer uh, genes, basically. And the way he explains it is that um, these, uh, these cells kind of have post-it notes, yeah? And that it says, hey, I'm cancer, grow. Hey, I'm cancer, grow. So that it doesn't forget that it's cancer. And it's that mechanism that keeps it being cancer. So they were trying to find ways to stop those post-it notes actually getting stuck in the first place. Um, and they found this idea, um, these JQ1 molecule, and it seemed to work really, really well. And rather than, it's an academic institution, which is a slight difference, so it's not a drug company. But rather than keep it in-house, in what they did is they, they did the opposite. They wrote to all their mates and said, look, this is what we're doing. They wrote a paper and they said, this is what we found. This is how you make the molecule. So this is the actual thing that would be the closely guarded secret. And they said, actually, you know what? If you want it, just mail us and we'll send it to you. So they basically said, we think this works and this is how we think it works. We need people to test it. So they sent some out to Oxford, at some crystallographers who sent back a picture, kind of like this, but a lot prettier, um, that, that let them see how that actually might be working in practice. So it let them explore. They knew it was working, but they didn't know why. And, that, and they couldn't have done that themselves. So that, that was, the condition of sharing was that they brought the results back to the team who sent out the molecules. Um, I know that they had 40 labs in the US take them up, about 30 across Europe. Um, and then in less than a year, they not only discovered that the, the stuff that they were looking at, the particular cancer they were looking at, they understood better why it worked, but they also, one team found out that it also helped to prevent uh, the growth of, abnormal growth of leukemia, so that they stopped being leukemia cells and started being white cells. And another group also found that um, multiple myeloma cells responded, and another group found that adipose, so fatty cells, um, in the liver stopped being fatty cells in the liver, which is a massive problem in communities where there's a lot of obesity. So basically, there were three different areas um, that they would never have even considered investigating, but because they open sourced what they were actually working on, people started saying, well, hey, I wonder if this applies to my research. And it turns out it wasn't a wonderful drug for cancer, but it did also turn out that it worked quite well in terms of male fertility. So this is one of the drugs they're looking at as a male pill, basically. And they would never have realised that if they hadn't been open. And what a difference that made in a year. If it had taken them a year to just figure out that, yeah, it worked quite well with the cancer they were looking at. But in that year, by being open with, other, with the other academic communities around the world, and drug companies, because obviously they were keen to get in on the action as well, there were three cancers that they potentially found that this molecule would affect. Um, and I think a lot of us in this, well, probably a lot of us in this room at some level have been, have been touched by cancer, whether it's direct family, friends and what have you. Are we really li willing to let that take years and years and years to happen with the current research and development process in the pharmaceutical industry? I'm not, to be honest. I would much rather they be open and consider these kind of principles to keep things moving forward. And there's a great quote here from Bill Joy. No matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. And, and so whatever industry you're working in, there are other people who are more clever working for someone else. Through open source principles, potentially you can open your ideas up to such a wide audience that you can start to innovate in ways that you would never have imagined possible. The likes of Apple, the innovation that comes out of them being able to use the open source libraries that are available to them is phenomenal. And applying that to other industries is just um, incredible. The next one, just check time, the next industry um, was architecture. And architecture I wouldn't necessarily associate with open source either. They spent like, what, seven years at university or something? So they want to make as much money as they can when they graduate, obviously. Pay off the beer debt. <laughs> um, but um, it also can make a huge difference to communities if the architecture is being developed in a sustainable way and in collaboration with the community. 
Um, and a, a guy called Cameron Sinclair and a, a lady called Kate Stoll um, were really deeply dissatisfied with um, the amount of people who were living in abject poverty and the amount of people who were living in slums just because there was no input from architects. You know, why would an architect go and do work in a slum? They, the, the people who lived there couldn't afford it. Um, but the, with a small amount of investment of knowledge from an architect, there can be massive changes in these slums. Um, and so these guys applied the open source principles to the world of architecture. And they said, well, we can't do it all ourselves. We don't know what's going on in the local communities. But there are architects in the local communities who know what's going on. And they haven't got the resources. So maybe we can bring together the resources with the architects and with the local knowledge and figure out a way that we can get the global knowledge of architects around the world to come together in a way that's reproducible, that people can access really easily for low cost, that they can re reproduce again and again and again around the world. And their quote is, how do you improve the living standards of five billion people? And they say, well, with 100 million solutions. And so that's what they're trying to do. At the moment, they've got uh, 14,819 architectural projects which are open sourced under the Open Architecture Network. They've got one, they estimate 1,648,000 people have budgeted from 156 projects that have actually happened as a result of the Open Architecture Network. And they have 44,512 members of this network, architects who said, I'm up for that, you know, if there's a project that I can help with, I'll help. And the way they do that is, Sometimes it's formal tenders from governments. Sometimes they run competitions. So they say, here's the need. We need to um, build mobile health clinics in Africa for HIV testing and treatment. Um, design something. So all these architects can then design something, and then the winning solution is implemented. And all of the solutions go up on this site. So even the ones that haven't been awarded go up on the site. And what they do is they actually join forces with the local community. So the local community get upskilled because they're taught how to build these structures. They're taught how to plan these structures. In some cases, they involve the community in actually designing the structures. And so it's paying it forwards in some ways. It's empowering people to actually uh, take up these ideas and, and keep it moving forward. So here's some examples. On the left here, you can see the instructions that come on the website, which you can download. Um, this pack, this in particular is like a flat pack. I think it costs, I haven't got it written down here, but it's something like $200 or something. Um, it comes flat pack. These are the instructions in plain English with pictures, so if you don't speak English, you can see it. Um, and this was originally for Granada. They had a massive hurricane there, which decimated the country. They lost 75% of their housing, all of their main cash crop of nutmeg so they have no way of actually being able to pay for anything to recover. Um, these shelters over the last eight years have been developed, they're now using better material as other architects have got involved and said oh well it would be better if you considered this material. They're now completely waterproof and importantly they're hurricane proof and they've been used in Haiti for the last year with no damage whatsoever sustained for a couple of hundred dollars. So it's really made a huge difference. And on this website, the Open Architecture Network, there's everything from football stadiums to disaster relief houses. Everything in between. Uh, they've got hemp houses and goodness knows what else. But one of the, the other thing that they look at is how can this actually help the community? Not only fulfill the need right now, but help the community. And they had a project on there which was a Kenaf clinic. And this stuff, you buy, a, buy seeds, plant it in a whacking great circle, grows in a couple of weeks to this height. So a visiting doctor is coming to do an HIV clinic. They grow it in a circle. They lock off the top, put a, a roof on the top. And then once the clinic has been held, they chop it down and eat it. Because this is edible. Yeah? And so this was an architect who came up with this idea. I guess they've probably seen this somewhere and gone, well, you could make like a reed a surround of a building. And so, and of course, when it grows, you get the seeds to grow the next batch, and it, it, it pays it forward. So all of these kind of ideas are just coming about by people bouncing ideas off each other, sharing ideas, perhaps ideas that they might charge for normally. Um, and at one point, there was a Creative Commons license that was specifically for developing nations. 
so that if it was released it could then be used in any developing nation and a lot of these were actually um, open sourced under that license. But another area which I find really fascinating, how many people actually understand the law and the legal system? Uh, no, exactly. If something changes in law, do you know what it was and what it changed to? No clue, me either. And so um, in New York, they've actually put it on GitHub. <laughs> and this is really interesting. It's on GitHub. You can go and have a look at it. Open legislation, a repo. Um, it's a JSON. For those of you who are technical, I'm not a developer, but I understand kind of ish. So if I use the wrong words, please don't ridicule me. Um, so this is just showing you a diff a chain between the past version and the current version. The green lines are showing you new stuff, and the red lines are telling you stuff that's been taken out. And this is the unique commit number. You can um, ask questions, have discussions. I'm guessing a lot of you have used GitHub, but some of you might not have done. Um, so it's just an interesting new way of working. And they're using this to actually power the website. So you can actually track the GitHub repo and find out when there's changes, go in and see what the changes are. And you can imagine the next step would be, well, why don't we allow citizens to actually fork a law, propose changes, and then have a pull request? You know? <laughs> awesome. So like, uh, and uh, there was a guy on um, Ted who was saying, well, you know, why don't he, uh, he posed the question, why don't all lawyers use version control? Uh, this was the answer. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe not always, but mostly. People who have a GitHub and actually care about participation and involvement and lawyers with the power. Yeah? Um, there was a friend of mine who was at Parliament Hack recently, and mm -hmm. the UK Parliament are putting together an API. Yeah. And the issue that, the, that they found was um, that the, they were, we're apparently becoming really good as a country about ex this open data, transparency yeah. stuff as a country. But we have the Hansard, which is things that people, it's like a basically a transcript, as I might be getting that really wrong, but it's basically a transcript of what our parliamentarians mm -hmm. have said. And the trouble is that the laws they're voting on and the transcript of the Hansard, they talk about 20 different things mm -hmm. and the data can't tie up. But it, it's, yeah. it's, we're trying to do the same thing, but we have this system which was from like the 1600s or yeah. something. We've had this, this same transcript running forever in parliament. And they're like, okay, we need to get the data out of it oh, it's just this stream of text from like hundreds of years old. So uh, I think it's interesting that they're doing it that way. Yeah. Our, our system is so old, everyone's just kind of staring at it going, oh. Yeah, how are we going to do that? Yeah. But if you think about it, you know, in areas other than law, like your own company's internal documentation, your own company's staff policies, your, you know, why not have them in a GitHub repo, or, or private GitHub repo maybe, or just a Git repo if you're a development business? Because it does allow people to have the opportunity to actually have conversations and it engages people and it empowers people. So rather than me saying to my developers, this is what's going to happen, you know, I can propose a change. Unfortunately, I have had to learn how to use Git and such like, kicking and screaming, I might add. So I can propose them and say, look, this is why I'm proposing it. I'm changing it from this to this because of this legislation. Go and read the link because I'm not putting it all here. Comment. You know, and then we can have an open discussion. People can suggest changes and so forth. And we make, can merge it all in, and they've been engaged in that in that conversation. So applying the principles of open source doesn't necessarily mean that you are completely open, but it means that you're actually being open to the possibility. And I think the thing that people say is, oh, we've got a transparent system. Yeah, so you're telling people stuff, but you're not giving them the opportunity to come back in. And I think with our government, it's very much like this. The United States are kind of working working on this, so they're working at the two-way conversation. But it does take a change in culture, it does take a change in technology, perhaps a change in systems if we have just got this massive long line of thing that nobody can interpret. In, in their defence, they really argue about, I was at a, a cabinet office hack, mm -hmm. they really are try, try, they're trying. They're trying, really yeah, they're trying. Um, but it, I really believe it does need to flow both ways. Um, and I really... Um, I, find, I take great um, enthusiasm when I hear about the ways that the principles of open source and sharing and community and engagement are actually being applied in areas other than code. It's great to see it in code, but it's great to see people being innovative and taking those ideas outside of the coding sphere. And it's the stuff on the edges where you can get some really cool ideas for, for bringing it back into coding. So if you look at the way people are applying these, it can give you ideas for actually changing 
the way that you're uh, working within your organisation. Uh, so in conclusion, I really believe the world needs open source. I really believe that the principles and the technology, but essentially the principles of open source have got the ability to make real change in the world in our lifetimes. You know, not like waiting until our children's children. And I think it's our responsibility to be open to that. So if we are working in proprietary environments, maybe to just have a look and see whether there are areas that you could be more open. I'm not saying suddenly you became, become an open source evangelist like me, but maybe just be open to the fact that there might be areas that you could consider using. And I would really suggest that you explore if there are any ways that you can use what you're doing in a proprietary environment to actually benefit the wider world. If there are little snippets of code that you're using that are really pucker that would really help other people, is that little snippet going to be that critical to your business that you can't release it? So have the dialogue, start the questions with your bosses. If you're the boss, then think about it. Um, and consider how we can all take the open source uh, movement forward. Just a quick, quick question. I'm, you know, I'm really interested, I'm, I'm really supportive as well of open source. I work for IBM and you know, we're very supportive of Linux and operating yeah. systems like that. But what's your view of um, security? And does it, does it make people that want to put malicious code into perhaps mm -hmm. enterprises, does it, do it makes it easier for them to have uh, access to open source? Or? I think, I think it's always the duty of the key holder to look at what you're implementing. So if you're considering op uh, open source, um, you still need to look at well, what, is the, what are the um, checks in place to make sure that that isn't malicious. In the Joomla community, people tend to say to us, you're releasing fixes all the time, so you must be insecure. It's like, well, yeah, I, I see that side of the uh, um, argument, but we also have an incredibly uh, proactive strike team as soon as there's a security vulnerability, they're working on it and there's a patch release before it gets anywhere near being released. The vulnerability comes from the people who don't listen, don't update, don't patch and don't apply the things that they've been provided. Um, and it's the same with Linux operating systems. If there's a security bug, a patch is put <coughs> out if you don't apply the patch. <laughs> um, so does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I, I'm also thinking, you know, Things like Linux, you know, if the operating, even when it's patched, mm. you know, people who want to be malicious and do the wrong thing, they can they can still GPC all of that source and then just find another way in. So that's, that's all I'm thinking about. It's yeah. just that does it does open, open source is great, absolutely, yeah. but does it make it easier? For surely, surely the fact that more people can see the source means that it's more likely to be noticed if there is a bug. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was going to say the Apple, the Apple one. The only people who notice the NSA, you know, like, oh, we won't mention that. <laughs> about the Apple bug that came out last week is um, we've I've just been kicking and screaming for into using PHP Storm. I don't know if any of you guys use that. Um, but I'm used to using Cape where control D comments a line and in PHP Storm it duplicates the line. So when I saw that bug and it was caused by a, a duplicate fail line or something, I was like, I could so have done that myself <laughs> so easily. But yeah things like that when there are more eyeballs on it it does tend to get picked up really quickly. Um, and if there is a bug reported in open source projects with large communities, generally it's jumped on quite quickly. Generally, generally. Um, it does depend on the strength of the community. It does require people to actually engage with that community. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I say, on the leadership team for Joomla, so that, and I'm on the community leadership team, so that's my soapbox. Um, <coughs> Security by obscurity is going to get you hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think actually, if, if someone wants to be mischievous, it, I really don't think it matters if it's closed or open source. No, if they just send an email to one of your staff and they click on the attachment, and you, yeah. you know, Target was an example, wasn't mm. it, where one email caused that's chaos. Right. Maybe yeah. they didn't have great practices, but. Open all they're always going to find ways through, yeah. They'll yeah. find ways. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Just on, the, on that same note, I think it's interesting that the, the open source community, I think, do embrace that almost lack of security there. The Chromium, Chrome, slash Google, if you want to call it, challenge where they offer, I don't know what the prize is up to these days, but every year they basically say, look, if you can get into a sandbox environment in Chrome, it's like a million dollars. Let's go. And and the, the, the original source is, uh, well, what is now Blink and Chromium and, and those engines. They 
encourage that and they use that accessibility as a security pro rather than, yeah. as you say, yeah. security. Yeah. Yeah. security. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, think of proprietary both operating systems and web browsers, which are pretty secure. It's Windows and Internet Explorer. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's interesting. And, because, and the challenge with, I mean, I, I will freely admit that at times I haven't been strictly within licensing requirements. <laughs> And that has dissuaded me at times from updating. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, and so and other people I know have been have thought I don't want to do updates because I don't have a valid license anymore or whatever reason. Um, whereas with an open source, you don't have that issue. A patch is done, you can download it and install it. So there are you know there are swings and roundabouts. Some people want the security of an of a closed source system where they have paid support and they can pick up the phone. Um, there are a hell of a lot of support providers for open source projects who do just the same. Yes, you still pay for it, sure, you still pay for it. Um, but I mean, there's an example, the mayor of Munich, who um, they went over to open source and they're saving like billions of euros, millions certainly of euros, even when you take into account reskilling their entire workforce and migrating the whole thing, all of that, they're still saving massive amounts of money. So, yeah. And just before I finish, I really appreciate open source. So these are the projects that I've used in doing this presentation. So, <laughs> Did, during your research for this yeah. um, and and getting deeper into open source. Um, did you discover any more platforms for enabling? So uh, I read a post recently from um, an, from an investor, and he said they they was they had stopped in. He said a lot of his pitches were. Uh, you call them this for that development, so it's it's Instagram for cats, or it's it's this for that. Yeah. He said we're not interested in that. We're not interested in, in, in LinkedIn for dogs. But what he said the only one thing we're really interested in is GitHub for because GitHub is the enabler that allows a, allows mm -hmm. a community to come. Out. Did you find like the architecture people? Are they using Git Git architecture or whatever the equivalent that is? Is there mm -hmm. are there other if, if, if open source is to move beyond development, because really they need a GitHub in their way for that? They use their own, they have their own industry systems. So uh, we work occasionally with GIS and they have open source systems that they can use to do GIS and there's closed source systems. And it depends on the company's persuasion as to which ones they choose to use. Um, but where there is a community, there will often grow things. Yeah, so people will be dissatisfied with paying for commercial versions and providing you have the team and the skills, you can make a different version. That's where a lot of open source projects come from. You know, people not wanting to use the closed source version for whatever reason and saying, sod it, I'll make my own. I just, I just wondered about the actual, because the BBC lost all that money when they were trying to create a tool to have all their program makers put all of their resources into the same system and they couldn't get it to work. It seems that sometimes the issue with open source isn't the will or the, the thoughts, it's, it's the actual, GitHub is incredible for, I mean, you could just call it Git in general, whether it's GitHub or not, but it, if you don't have two pieces of architecture software that speak to each other, even if they're mm -hmm. both individually open source, if there's no, uh, you, you mentioned that you use closed source software because of that, yeah. The, the connection yeah. to the stack. Yeah. If you don't have that platform that can speak to each other, the, the example he gave was GitHub for musicians. Mm. Like if you could maybe start a song in Pro Tools yeah. and have someone else fork your song and just do it in another score key does that. And, and something mm. like that and have that, I wonder if that was an issue for architects or something like that. Yeah. I think the challenge is if you're trying to integrate with proprietary software, the proprietary guys have to want to work with open source. Microsoft are trying. Um, but they, that's not the main focus, so they do it when it's good for them, as any business would. Um, uh, and the challenge is... They often is, come up with their own proprietary open source. <laughs> yeah, they, they often try to get stuff into the open source stacks that help them, but don't necessarily, but like hinder the, everyone else. And so the challenge is finding a bridge, like making bridges between. So that's been a challenge for the Joomla project, getting Joomla to run on enterprises that are not using MySQL. So Postgres and SQL and other databases, because you've got if you want to get into the enterprise market, it's got to. So, but it is about collaboration, and proprietary isn't always that easy to establish those lines. So, I think we're yeah. pretty much done. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs>